wouldn't it be fabulous? The millionaire lifestyle for just a few pence. Join me in my garden as I pick some simple flowers to enjoy indoors. Hello there, I'm Julie from Julie Davis Flower Workshops and Flower Start, the online flower arranging classes. It's a beautiful spring day here in Kent in the southeast of England. Ages ago, I picked up a book by Constance Spry from a charity shop. It was called Simple Flowers. It's got the subtitle, A Millionaire for a Few Pence. Constance Spry explains that flower decoration societies have done much to add to the general pleasure of daily life of many people. They have done something which I find important. They have, in their search for subjects with which to extend their palettes for painting pictures with living materials, brought to prominence unusual, old-fashioned, even neglected plants and so saved them from possible oblivion. As I read Constance Spry's words, I'm taking back to another time. Chapter one is called Prelude to Summer. And this is what Constance says. One wonderful morning in May, I went out to gather flowers for the pictures for this book. The winter had seemed exceptionally long, with none of those breaks into mildness that are kinder to humans than to trees. Bitter winds, cold days and colder nights had kept growth in uninterrupted check. Suddenly the air softened and everything burst into bloom. In chapter two, Constance's thoughts turn to what she calls the loveliest of the year. Here she says, summer ushered in, how quickly the weeks fly by, the feasts of rose and lily and a hundred other sweetnesses of the garden rush upon us in an ecstasy and are gone before they can be savoured to the full. You can just imagine the riot in the garden that forms chapter three. Constance says, by mid-July there was a riot of colour in the garden and much material for indoor arrangements. Lilies and delphiniums carry on the elegance of the earlier beauties and to these are added all range of homelier flowers. As the white delphiniums are, for me, the highlight of this moment, I write of these first. Constance goes on to say, if by any unhappy chance you share the rigid view of some who say in no uncertain tones delphiniums ought to be blue, then I warn you that, acting entirely out of character, I am out to convert you, and in doing so, hope to extend the pleasures of your garden life. This would be easy enough if, on one warm evening, I could take you into the garden and let you see the tall, graceful spikes glimmering in the dusk. For like many white flowers, these are at their lovely best at twilight. And what about the scents of the garden? This is something Constance talks about in chapter four of her book. She says, I think it's fair enough to regard lilac among the few pence flowers, since it grows in the less favoured positions in country gardens, as well as in many a dusty town yard. Outside my north facing door are some old bushes and on a May morning, the air is laden with the sweetness of their dew-drenched flowers. I know nothing more refreshingly exciting. At evening, a lilac hedge bathed in sun all day fills the air with a richer, deep languor. And once again, I wonder at the ineffable beauty of this most easily grown shrub. She goes on to say... Most of us have come to realise that lilacs are particularly to be appreciated if they are planted so as to be seen from above, when one may look down on them from a window. The same idea is worth consideration when using the flowers indoors. Lilacs, massed in a bowl or box, set low on a coffee table or stool, is not only good to look down on, but for such an arrangement, short stem pieces are suitable, and these last better than longer branches. Neither, of course, do well if one neglects to remove the leaves from the flowering stems, not, of course, discarding useful sprays, but arranging them among the flowering heads, though detached from them. After the tips of the stems are crushed, the sprays may be put into a deep hot bath and left there overnight. 
chapter 5, is all about leaves, green groups and green tinted flowers. This is, what's, this is what Constance says. All through the winter, there are two types of arrangement in my sitting room which give me perpetual pleasure. A, large, a pair of large vases on either side of a table set against the wall are kept filled with evergreens. Sometimes we use branches of shining laurel, sometimes ivy in both its upright and trailing forms, and a special treat, evergreen oak, loveliest of all in its grace and green-grey colouring. Constance explains it takes a long time to prepare and arrange these greens, but then they last a very long time, provided and always provided that we remember to fill up regularly. She says she once had a vase of ivy that lasted from November to February. And what about what Constance calls, in chapter 6, the mellowing year? She says there are moments of the year when, when one is assailed by a longing for colour, strong, warm, even crashing colour, and in the last wet week of a cold September this hunger fell upon me. With none of the usual considerations of choosing, I went around the garden picking up all that was gay. Dahlias, Michaelmas daisies, scarlet salvia, red roses and crimson, brilliant geraniums. The purple thistle, flowers of the cardoon and the bright leaves of begonia. The bunch glowed and nothing was done to calm it down by the choice of container. And on the subject of containers, constant spry is in her element just as much today as she ever was, especially with the move to go for more foam-free flower arrangements. We talk about using chicken wire in our mantle vases or windowsill vases, or perhaps even we call them our constant spry vases. Constance devotes chapter 7 of her books to containers, and this is what she says. Fashion in flower arrangement has led to a change of tastes in vases. Convention has relaxed its grip and there is a greater freedom of choice of containers for every kind of flower group. Agreeable association of vase and flower plays an important part in contemporary arrangements and it is necessary to find ways and means of requiring what we need without having to spend large sums of money. For the simple and the wild flowers, containers may be contrived with bark and other driftwood or shells. One of the prettiest I remember was a pearl-tinted shell fixed in the spreading fingers of a branch of grey coral, suitably filled with silvery leaves and delicate pink fuchsia. It made an exquisite picture and might have found a place in the most elegant surroundings. Simpler, of course, but available to all, are containers made with scallop shells joined together with cement, the joint hidden by small shells set into it. These are suitable for small arrangements and damp moss or, florisc or a florist commodity called floripack, I guess that's flower foam or oasis as we commonly know it, may be needed to hold the stems and keep them moist for the shells are shallow and hold but little water. Reading directly from this chapter, Constance goes on to say, The branches of apple blossom on page 33 were heavy and spreading and in consequence exerted considerable leverage. It would have been lovely to put them in a heavy celadon or bronze, but having neither, I took a capacious tin of good plain size, painted it with flat blue paint and weighted it with a few heavy stones under the tangle of two-inch wire netting. It was steady as a rock, held plenty of water and I do not think it proclaims too rudely its humble origin. It seems important to use flat and not glossy paint. I do not quite know why, except one seems to me to look better than the other, though again there are exceptions to this. Perhaps this is the moment to mention ex an exception. In winter, when colour is so highly desirable and so lamentably expensive in the flower world, there is a simple way of making small quantities of brightly coloured materials, such as rich coloured anemones or a head or so of geranium, shine out with particular effect. A tin or box of suitable shape and pleasant proportions is given an undercoat of white paint, 
sandpapered to smoothness and finished with good, brilliant scarlet lacquer. Filled with the bright flowers, the whole thing glows and although it would be pleasant to have a real Chinese lacquer box, this makeshift is not to be despised. A more ambitious version of this box, fitted with a tin lining, undercoated, sandpapered and then lacquered white and delicately painted with little bunches of flowers in the old fashion in the fashion of old porcelain, filled with moss roses, this container called for no apology. On page 29 is seen an old Bible box on a stand holding summer flowers. It's much the sort of bunch that you might pick up from any summer garden. Gay and pretty, but not really the easiest thing to arrange in good shape. This box is my salvation when flowers are plentiful and they are not and they are not, I can shut it up and put it away. The flowers have plenty of water, plenty of room. Some of them are inclined to assume pleasant curves, and one arrangement like this is more satisfying than a number of small ones. Because I enjoy using a box of this shape, I had the one shown on pages 26 and 43 made. For convenience, it was made to accommodate a baking tin, and it was then painted soft celadine green in flat paint. I bought a tin of cool green robilac and a tube of paint of white and one of black and mixed the colours to my lighting, liking. A plain wooden stool painted in the same way forms a stand for it. There is a picture of a plastic shopping basket from Woolworths on page 54. It was opaque and white and we painted it on the outside with flat yellow paint. We also bought one of the translucent pink and painting the inside this time with white paint found that it acquired the appearance of opaque pink glass. The handles were cut away and we had two capacious well-shaped containers which required no inside lining. Baskets of good design are much used for garden flowers but often they are primarily suitable for horizontal arrangements. That on page 53 is good for tall arrangements. The handles and excrescences of ornament were cut away and a large tin inside holds water. The rustic containers referred to earlier are perhaps on the whole more suitable for country rooms, though much depends on their construction. A lucky find of a beautiful piece of grey driftwood may present a possibility of ex elegance. There is a simple example on page 25. Sometimes, of course, one sees and makes mistakes. Too much whimsy, perhaps. Too many bizarre effects resulting from undue striving after originality. And it is, and it is as well to watch and exercise restraint. Having said this, it seems a bit dangerous to introduce the little group on page 54, which is in an eggshell. But the truth is that an egg is a beautiful shape and the shell can be successfully used for the little bunches of flowers that children like to gather. A school competition of flowers arranged in eggshells would, I warrant, produce some charming things. In order to cut the top off cleanly, I had this one hard boiled and used a sharp knife. I scooped out the contents with care. As the shell was fragile, I thought it best to fill it with floral pack and then I submerged the whole thing in water till this was thoroughly soaked. After I had set it in an upturned candle dripper, I had what seemed to me a shapely, delicate container for small flowers. I filled it, as you see, with three miniature roses, a scrap of fern, forget-me-not, and a stem of London pride. I expected it to last a few days, and it surprised me by lasting a week. This little rose, by the way, as I mentioned in Party Flowers, comes from one of the miniature rose trees which are a speciality of Mrs Robinson of Nottingham. The candle bowls shown on page 36 are not home contrived. We, had them we made them commercially after struggling with a problem at a coronation banquet. We wanted on that occasion to fill the arms of a beautiful candelarium with poses of flowers and only achieve this satisfactorily by having the posies very neatly constructed by a skilled florist. We liked the result 
and determined to repeat it more simply for less formal occasions when for one reason or another we wanted to use a candelabra in a similar way. It is possible but not easy to con contrive holders so we decided to have them properly made. In the picture they are shown filled with candy tuff in various colours. In what may be called proper vases some very good shapes are being manufactured once again. Plain, that is to say not over and ornamented and often of classic design, they fit into almost any type of room. For example, the famous firm of Copeland are now making a small urn in a plain white suitable for a contemporary room. There is a picture of a smaller and less important Copeland vase on page 43 which fulfils a similar dual purpose. Indeed, wherever you look you may see that the manufacturers are becoming aware of the needs of those of us who enjoy arranging flowers and are producing suitable containers in a variety of shapes at not too great a cost. I hope you've enjoyed spending a few moments with me in my spring garden. It's so interesting to hear the Queen of Flower Arranging talking about floral pack when we're trying these days to move away from single-use plastics. Let me know in the comments what's growing in your garden at the moment and the favourite vases you like using. Do give this video a like and don't forget to share it with your flower friends. That's all for me for now and I'll see you in the next video.